Realtors, good afternoon. Uh, this is Nick checking in with you. It is Wednesday, September the 16th. And today we've got a special treat for you. It's a broker update with uh, several of your SCR team members here. And today we're gonna talk about a few different topics, but I wanted to uh, start the, the session uh, with uh, just, a, just a little bit of, a, uh, of an oversight. You know, it, we're what, six months into this coronavirus pandemic, right? And uh, lots of things have changed during those six months uh, from the way you interact with your clients to the way you interact with your agents um, and the way we do our work here, you know, at the association. Um, you know, at the very beginning of this process, you know, governments told us to uh, stay at home. And it was you, our realtors, that made sure that we had a home to stay in. And over the course of, of the initial stages of the pandemic, we uh, uh, secured uh, many, I think, uh, you, you call them victories, I, I call it essentials for doing business. And whether it was at the, at the local, state, or, or federal level, um, we, we made sure that real estate stayed an essential service, uh, that we weren't locked out at the, at the local or state level. Uh, Congress passed the payroll protection program, unemployment benefits for independent contractors for the first time ever, uh, small business grants, uh, extending CE deadlines and, and making sure that uh, CE could be offered virtually, uh, expanding the number of PSI testing centers recently, which we, which we talked about, and, and the list goes on. Um, we have had, uh, I think, a, a great relationship and none of these things could, not, could have been accomplished uh, without your support, your involvement with your association. And, uh, and um, we know that you're under a tremendous amount of stress right now uh, keeping up with the market. Uh, our latest market reports show that more than half the state uh, has uh, uh, caught up with 2019 and our year to date numbers have exceeded those, those reports. And uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more. I'm gonna talk more about, uh, get into the detail of the market reports tomorrow. But today I wanted to, to have a conversation with some of our staff and I wanna to introduce to you, we have Alan Likely, our uh, COO uh, with us today, Sarah Brown, our uh, Realtor Party Director. Um, we have Byron King, our General Counsel, and uh, Austin Smallwood, our Director of Legal and, and Regulatory Affairs. Lindsey Jackson was scheduled, our Chief Advocacy Officer was scheduled to be with us today. Um, but as we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, she is currently at the State House. Hopefully, she's not in the middle of those uh, anti mask uh, protesters uh, like she was yesterday. But we're going to give you a quick uh, State House update uh, a little bit later today, too. So, uh, before we get uh, too far down the road, um, uh, I see we've got uh, uh, almost 100 participants uh, in the uh, webinar today. We're also streaming this session live on, on Facebook as well. And I uh, want to say hello to Carol and, and Dave and, and Ellen and Everett. Uh, Charlie Ray is on today. Great to, great to see Charlie, past president from Conway with us today. Uh, Janine Keys, Janet, and, and many, many others. Um, please, um, if you're familiar with the Zoom platform, which Unfortunately, we probably are all are by now. Uh, make sure that if you have a question, if you have a comment, put it into the chat. Uh, we'll be uh, going through that chat box uh, a little bit uh, uh, later toward the end of the presentation. We're not gonna go on too long today. Uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for uh, some Q&A. So let's start, uh, let's talk with our attorneys here on staff first and let's talk about this CDC uh, eviction moratorium. Um, Byron, give us the, the kind of the nutshell version of, of what we're, in case somebody's been you know, hiding under a rock the last few days and isn't aware of it. 
Right. Thanks, uh, Nick. So September 4th through December 31st of this year, the uh, Centers for Disease Control, CDC, the federal government, has issued a, an eviction moratorium uh, basically for public health to make sure people can shelter in place uh, and don't spread the uh, COVID-19 virus. So at this point, there are ways to still evict. This is just for non-payment of rent, basically for folks that had income loss due to the COVID-19. Um, so if folks are doing stuff that breaks the lease or breaks laws, drug dealing, there's ways to evict. Um, so our recommendation on the hotline is for any uh, property managers to recommend the landlord hire an attorney to handle the eviction because there are ways to perhaps even uh, attack the uh, the declaration that the uh, tenant has to make saying that they're you know income restricted they have no other options um, and then all the other ways you can evict uh, for breaking the lease or other other legal issues so we we've already seen reports of of, of abuse from um you know May, uh, the day that this order was issued, apparently some of these mega landlord uh, corporations uh, uh, filed uh, numerous, numerous eviction orders. Um, we've already seen reports of tenants looking to take advantage of the situation. Um, you know, the, the, the declaration form that the CDC uh, has uh, made available simply ask the, the, the tenant, right, to sign off on, on four questions. And now there is, you know, the threat of perjury, you know, under, under, under a threat of perjury there, but um, do, do, the tenant doesn't have to submit any additional paperwork, do they? No, but uh, perhaps a lawyer uh, trying to evict under this could argue that they've breached the lease, or at least the SCR 410 requires accurate information on the application, so arguably you could attack they haven't made their best efforts to get rental assistance. They're making more than $99,000 a year. Uh, they're able to pay partial rent. Uh, they have other options for shelter. Um, and all these fees will be due December 31st. So uh, any charges, late fees, and any rents are gonna come due December 31st. So it's Austin. not a rent holiday. <laughs> Austin, have you, have you had any calls on the hotline yet about this? Not, not about this particularly. Um, you've gotten a few of the eviction questions and kind of the same guidance we give as, as Byron with how complex this is on, you know, in addition to how normally complex evictions are, this really is a time for your property manager to uh, be consulting with their attorney to make sure uh, they're doing everything by the book, um, that they've got all the proper documentation, um, and also to get some guidance on some potential, you know, alternative dispute resolution uh, or how long it's going to take in their particular court given the backlog. I think in most cases, uh, the housing providers, the landlords, are going to find a way to to accommodate a, a tenant that's in trouble as 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 best they can if they've been impacted by COVID-19. But we've already um, uh, heard some reports from magistrates and in, in Sumter County and and other places that uh, this form is is the uh, is game over basically. If you if you have filed a, an eviction. Uh, since uh, the end of August, um, and the tenant presents this at any stage of the, that eviction process, this declaration form, the magistrates have been told, that's it. The, 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 the hearing process is over, and it's going to be held in abeyance until after December 31st. NAR, our national association, has launched a full-fledged effort uh, to address this issue um, they uh, initially launched a call to action uh, targeted through um, the uh, uh, federal political coordinators. That's gone uh, uh, across the board now, right, Sarah? All FPCs are now uh, involved in that process. Um, and uh, I know that, that we have contacted all of our congressmen and alerted them to the fact that uh, a rental eviction moratorium without rental assistance is a recipe for absolute uh, disaster. And, and we uh, are facing a situation in January where you have four months or more of rent that's due plus applicable late fees and, and whatnot, right, Byron? And, yes, sir. And then suddenly the, the landlord also uh, has, you know, 
property taxes to pay, they've got insurance, they've got their obligations. And, and without this income coming in, um, there is uh, going, going possibly be uh, foreclosure issues and, and other burdens on, on, on housing providers. Um, Byron, we've got a, a, a question. Um, if y'all can please use the chat box for questions, but I, I, I noticed that there's a Q and A here. It says, if, if a tenant's on a month to month lease, can you give the tenant a written 30 days notice to vacate? Um, the owner does not want to renew uh, the lease. Byron, what's, uh, what would be your take on that? You can try it. I mean, this is all new. We're learning along with the landlord. So if a lease expired, uh, you could try it. The problem is if they stay in there, you're faced with trying to get an eviction ejectment order, and then this would probably attach. Uh, keep in mind our lease, the SCR 410, they've got to maintain the property. They can't have unauthorized occupants. They can't sublease. Uh, so all the other issues that can come up besides non-payment of rent, you can still evict on. Yeah, that's that's correct, and and I think based on what the magistrates magistrates have been told, that uh, I think whether it's a month to month or not, I think it would have put a stop to that eviction process. Commercial broker asks if the moratorium is applicable to commercial tenants. The CDC order only applies to residential tenants, right? That's my reading. Yeah, and that's that's what. Uh, is spelled out in the uh, CDC order. There are other um, provisions under the CARES Act that uh, uh, have expired or may have been extended that may apply to commercial tenants, but this isn't uh, in the CDC order. One last thing before we beat this uh, horse to death, I wanted to let you know that SCR, we've reached out to Attorney General Alan Wilson and, and asked for some guidance and assistance um, we have um, uh, asked for some clarification on the point that Byron made a few minutes ago. Uh, can the um, declaration form be challenged by the housing provider or a landlord? Can, you, can the landlord go to the magistrate and say, uh, ask the tenant for proof of the declarations that they've made on that form? Um, and that's the question we've posed with our attorney general. Um, attorney Jeff Young in his office has been assigned the, um, uh, the, the, the case, so to speak. And uh, I hope to be speaking with Jeff later this week. So uh, stay tuned for some more information there. Uh, another question is, if the landlord does not have a government-backed loan, can they evict prior to December for non-payment? This uh, CDC order has nothing to do with whether or not the property is backed by a mortgage. Uh, it applies to all residential uh, tenant uh, uh, relationships. Correct, guys? I'm, I'm right on that, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, one last thing um, today, or I'm sorry, yesterday, uh, NAR President Vince Malta and, uh, uh, and other NAR leaders met with officials at the White House and, uh, and, and basically set, sounded the alarm and said, if there isn't a, a, a rental assistance component of this, that we're looking at a housing disaster in the making for January. Um, during, their, uh, during their time there, they, they explained that um, most uh, of these properties are owned by individuals, mom and pop uh, owners, uh, and how this could be devastating to uh, middle class, working class um, uh, property owners uh, around the country. The good news is, is that the, the White House staff said the administration is committed to working on an additional stimulus bill, even though Congress does not appear to be at this time. Um, although there was a little bit of an inkling yesterday uh, Speaker Pelosi indicated she might be willing to, to come off of her $3.4, $3.3 3 trillion uh, uh, HEROES Act uh, to work with the Senate leadership on, uh, on some possible compromise before uh, the uh, November election. And um, I guess it's kind of one of those things where we'll believe it when we see it, right? <laughs> 
Um, so let's switch gears uh, a little bit and um, uh, let me talk to Sarah since, we're, since we mentioned the election uh, in November. Um, Sarah, what, what, are we, what are we doing as, as an association or what has the General Assembly done uh, to help, you know, with coronavirus, there's still a lot of folks that are scared to, to go to the polls. Uh, it actually has become very controversial, a political kind of football. What what are we, what have we done, or what has the state house done to to make sure we get people out uh, and vote in November? Um, so the House representatives passed a bill um, that was already taken up by the Senate in early September that would allow all voters to ca cast absentee ballots due to COVID nineteen. Uh, the bill is now headed to Governor Henry McMaster, um, and that's for all registered voters. So if you're not registered to vote, um, you do need to do that by October third. Um, you need to mail that in by October 3rd. You can do it in person um, till October 5th. Uh, we've got 87% of our realtors are registered to vote. So that's good. That number can be better, but that is a good uh, starting so number. 13% of our members are not registered to vote. Correct. All right, let that sink in, everybody. Um, but yeah, so we've done get out the vote initiatives um, here at SCR. We did a mail campaign for non-registered voters and for registered voters, just reminding them of election day during the primary. And we'll do something similar via email um, for the general election. Great, great. Now, I know um, through RPAC, uh, realtors are not only politically uh, involved, but uh, we take active engagement in, in these races. How does that, how does that process begin uh, uh, at the local level? Um, so like you said, the process starts with the locals, um, with our candidate screening. The purpose of our candidate screening is to interview candidates for elected office, to get to know them, see where they stand on issues, and also educate them on our issues if need be. Um, our screenings are done at both the local and state level. Typically, the local legislative committee or RPAC committee conducts these interviews with candidates. Uh, the committee meets with all candidates in a particular race and then decides who they want to support based on that interview and their voting record um, on real estate related issues. Um, candidate screening is done at the local, state, and federal, so that means county council, city council, mayoral, all the way up to state house, state senate, um, and we even make recommendations to NAR um, at the federal level for our congressmen. Uh, the results of these candidate screenings um, can result in either an endorsement from that local association or a recommendation, and you can also even get an RPAC contribution from these candidate screenings. Um, if it's a local um, race that is completely decided by locals, they make the decision, they send the RPAC checks to the locals. If it's a state level race, that will go to our state RPAC trustees as well. Um, our trustees are actually meeting next week uh, to discuss these requests coming from our local boards. Um, they'll be meeting to discuss those, approve those uh, for the general election. Uh, the candidate screening process was a little different this year, as you can imagine. Uh, most of our local boards met with elected officials via Zoom. Um, so I'd like to first thank our local boards for all of your hard work this year, um, but also thank you for adapting um, to these unpredicted changes and doing it very quickly and efficiently and making my job easier. Um, so uh, I just appreciate you all so much for what you do. And I know the RPAC trustees um, do as well. You make our, our jobs much easier. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sarah. You know, there, there are, uh, in, in addition to, to great uh, realtor advocates that are running for office, we also have several realtors that are running for office. In Sumter, there are two realtors running for, for mayor. There's a realtor running for mayor in, uh, in Florence. Uh, we've got at least one realtor, one uh, uh, challenger uh, running for the state house down in Charleston. Um, what an exciting uh, election season. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, being able, once the RPAC trustees meet, 
we'll be sending out a, a voter scorecard, right, Sarah, uh, with a list of endorsements. And, uh, and keep in mind, it's, it's not about us telling you who to vote for. Uh, it's about uh, our PAC and the trustees letting you know where candidates stand on realtor issues. And ultimately, you cast your own vote um, with that information. That's the whole purpose of that. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, one, uh, since we're talking about elected officials, uh, I mentioned Lindsay Jackson earlier, our chief advocacy officer is not able to be with us today. She uh, is at the state house as we speak. And uh, she sent me a couple of notes to share with you concerning what's going on. So the, the legislature is in session uh, uh, to finish their COVID interrupted session, uh, which you know started in January, got interrupted in, in March, would have normally ended in May, but um, they've met a couple times over the summer and now they're here to finish um, uh, the budget and a couple of other, uh, a couple of other things. As, as Sarah mentioned, uh, they, they got the, the absentee voting bill done. Uh, we do expect the governor to, uh, to sign that, that legislation, uh, he's indicated at least that he would. Um, and the bill allows for absentee voting for any reason during the state of, of emergency, uh, meaning you don't have to be on vacation or, or, or out of state at the time of the election. And as Sarah said, exactly like uh, the process that was held uh, in June. So the Senate um, uh, yesterday uh, passed changes to the state budget that would provide a small raise to most teachers and hazard pay bonus for some lower paid state workers. The budget now heads back to the House for, de for debate. Um, the Senate plan also sets aside uh, over $500 million uh, just in case revenue project projections in the future dip uh, because of COVID-19's impact on South Carolina's economy, just kind of like a rainy day fund. The, the House and Senate are meeting today and they're gonna return next week to handle uh, board and commission elections and any other legislation that can be taken up uh, during this special uh, two week period. We are working diligently to get uh, business license fee reform and rollback tax uh, uh, legislation uh, passed this week. Uh, we're really, really close uh, we've got a couple of objections that we're trying to overcome, and uh, I know Lindsay and her team are, are working really, 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 uh, really, really hard to get that done uh, this week. So we'll keep you posted. Hopefully, uh, our Friday update will have some some good news for you uh, for all of our members. The business license fee, license fee reform bill, in particular, is a is a two year effort uh, negotiating with cities and counties. Um, to get this done to make it more business friendly, make it more efficient. Um, and uh, we're close. We're this close to the finish line. And I hope to get it done this week. So before we uh, open up the, the chat for, for additional Q&A, Austin, uh, tell me a little bit. Um, let's talk about legal hotline. What, what are some of the hot legal topics you've been getting uh, over the last couple of months? Yeah, I mean, with mostly it's been just a continuation of the big ones we normally get. I mean, the number one call we always get on the hotline um, is earnest money disputes. Uh, so a reminder again, I feel like I have to say this every time I, I give a talk. Uh, earnest money in the state of South Carolina can only be dispersed through mutual agreement of the parties or a court order. If your client, if you make sure you're giving your clients the earnest money disclosure, SCR form 620, whether you're representing a buyer or seller at the beginning of the transaction, that way they're completely aware of that. Um, the next thing we're seeing a lot of, obviously makes sense, is uh, repair issues, due diligence issues, um, making sure that everyone's aware of what exactly your rights are under each of these. Um, you know, making sure if you're a buyer and you're in repair procedure that you get all of your inspections and requests by a certain time period. And if you're a seller, uh, that you get your, your response back within a time period. And realizing that as soon as a seller tells you one way or the other, that if the seller tells you they are not making seller paid repairs, that that does start that two day two business day or that two calendar day window in repair procedure. Or alternatively, the easier option is just to do due diligence. Due diligence just gives you one deadline that everything has to be done by. Essentially, the parties come to an agreement by that deadline. The buyer terminates 
or we have an as-is contract in regards to repairs. Um, and then some 504 issues, uh, that's the buyer sales contingency, just making sure that if you do have one of those forms uh, on your, if you have a buyer who has to sell their house to buy another house, that you use that buyer sale contingency, that's gonna have some great language that's gonna prevent you from drafting language yourself, um, doing unauthorized practice of law, but make sure that you are filling in the blanks appropriately, giving both parties adequate time to meet their deadlines and using form 505 in conjunction with that uh, as the proper form to give notice. Thank you. What, um, I've gotten a few calls about the NAR's clear cooperation policy. Is that, is that becoming uh, a bigger issue or has that uh, been kind of accepted in the marketplace going forward? What have, what have y'all seen? Yeah, I mean, we get, we get some questions about that. I mean, the important thing on there is your listing agreement. Um, you do have two options. You have the, the first option, which states that we're gonna do public marketing of this property. If we're gonna do any public marketing, which means you know, word of mouth, Facebook, sign in the yard, et cetera, it's gotta be in the MLS within the set time period. Or if you do not want to put the house in the MLS, it's gotta be completely an office exclusive. You only can talk about it with people inside your office that includes you and your seller, you are not able to do any sort of uh, public marketing in any way, uh, shape or form. Um, you need to make sure that you're very, um, following both of those rules, uh, either what, option one or option two, um, and not trying to, to kind of skirt around it. Um, there are certainly people uh, looking out for it. If you have any questions on your local MLS rules, certainly would uh, tell you to contact your local MLS director. Awesome, thank you, Austin. Um, Byron, any other legal hotline topics that, uh, that, that you think we need to talk about today? Right, so I've gotten a, a couple recently talking about escalator clauses with the short inventory in the hot market uh, around the state. Multiple offers, generally sellers are going to ask for highest and best by deadline. And we've got some realtors that are trying to draft their own escalator clauses, which basically says, you know, words the effect, thousand dollars more than the next highest offer up to a cap of, you know, say $250,000. So we tried to dissuade realtors from doing this. Uh, Austin mentioned unauthorized practice of law. Also, you're telegraphing to the seller the top price with that cap. So a savvy seller is just going to counter offer at that cap. If all buyer agents use these things, they all ratchet up to their caps anyway. So just go highest and best. That's your best, your buyer's best chance to get the property. If the seller sends the SCR 312, the seller actually asks for no escalator clauses. And then uh, kind of wrapping up September safety month. So the SCR leadership's had an affiliation with Safe Showings, got a free trial going, a good safety app uh, when you're out there showing houses. So that, that's, a, that's a good point you make about escalator clauses. It's not really a, it's not really a good negotiation tool, is it? Um, right. Because you, you basically, you show your hand, you say, this is, this is my max offer. Um, and uh, in a hot market, like we have in, in more, than, more than half the state, um, that just isn't gonna be a very effective tool. Um, so thanks for, thanks for bringing that up today. Um, that's right, uh, and, and in addition, of course, um, uh, safe, uh, having a safety plan uh, for, for your brokers, if you are not, um, if you are not um, uh, uh, using or, or implementing a safety plan with all of your agents and, and reviewing that on a regular basis, um, I think there's uh, some, some risk reduction efforts that you can take within your own offices uh, to, to make sure that your, your agents are safe and that uh, uh, they're not putting themselves in, in, in risky situations. Unfortunately, we had a news report last month of, a, of another realtor attack. Um, please uh, don't let our members become uh, another statistic. Um, and uh, I know, I know y'all know how serious it is, but sometimes our agents, when, the, when markets, especially when they're so, so busy, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll skip or cut a corner to get somewhere and to meet somebody to be the first one there. And it can lead to um, a dangerous, uh, potentially dangerous situation. So um, Jennifer mentions that in the latest edition of Realtor Magazine, 
that, uh, that they actually recommend using an e escalation clause. Um, Jennifer, the only thing I can, the only, the best way I can respond to you in, in, in that is, it would be the same as if Realtor Magazine offered a, um, a, uh, a weather outlook uh, in their magazine and said, uh, and was trying to predict the weather in, in, in South Carolina. Uh, there are just certain marketplace um, tools and, and provisions that may work with the standards of practice in some states. Um, escalation clauses um, have just not been commonplace in South Carolina. And as we mentioned, uh, there are better ways, there are better ways to negotiate on behalf of your client um, if you're in a, in a multiple offer or, or, or a uh, hot market situation. But um, let's, uh, let's switch gears. Um, and um, I know we haven't uh, heard from Alan today. I was gonna say, uh, Nick, uh, Janet Gresham has a uh, question for us as well. What's Janet's question? What happens if another agent hears about an office, office exclusive listing and asks to share the property? You mean, an a I guess she means an agent in another office? Yes. Any, any answers for that, Austin or Byron? I would say that you're in, uh, you know, the safe answer is you assume it's publicly marketed at that point, it's outside your brokerage and you got that uh, one day to get it into the MLS and you're gonna show the property. And try to figure out why it got out and make sure that you're reinforced inside your brokerage that office exclusive means absolutely office exclusive because now we've sort of changed the listing that our client wanted and we may not have been acting in the best interest of our client. We could potentially face some ethics issues. It could have a leak, right? It's either intentional or unintentional and uh... If it's uh, intentional, that's a real problem. Uh, and even an unintentional problem uh, can, can lead to uh, issues as well. Um, Matthew writes, uh, a buyer uh, looks at a property and tells a friend who is also you know, looking for a home. And, and so he's right. There are, there are um, I guess, uh, innocent ways that that information could get uh, spread around and, and leaked around. The, the, the clear cooperation policy has been nothing short of controversial. Um, and I, I, would, I would say that uh, um, uh, the lawsuits that are pending against the policy in California uh, look like they're going to, going to fail based on initial, the, the judge's initial comments. Um, he says, if it's not listed in leaks, it seems like it would be prudent to get a compensation agreement. Always, uh, always prudent to get compensation agreements in writing uh, when possible. Um, and uh, I don't know how um, uh, there, are, uh, there are brokerages uh, that are dealing with this uh, clear question, yeah, the CC uh, policy in different ways. Any, any other questions from our, um, participants, our attendees today. We'll give you a minute to add them into the, the chat room. Nick Hugh uh, added a question as well. Yeah, I just, I just read that, okay. I think. Oh, no, if, if it's not listed and leaks, seems like, yeah, no, no. Yeah, I already, I already addressed that. Um, So for the brokers attending, if you, uh, we'll give you another minute here to, to add your questions in. If you, if there are no other questions, um, Mike, uh, are there any, any questions posted on the Facebook comments? Nope. All right. So uh, we are at uh, about 35 minutes. I told you we would keep this short this afternoon. We are going to conduct more of these uh, uh, updates as we go forward. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, we would uh, really appreciate uh, any questions that you have you wanna send us in advance. We'd love to present it uh, during this open format and uh, answer it for the benefit uh, of all our members. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, Marianne, for listening in and, and for, for everyone this afternoon. 
Uh, we uh, wish you all the best. Stay safe and uh, stay realtor strong. We'll see you next time.